All right. Well, this time we're going to do away with the uh, five-minute wait on the front because you guys have been jumping in pretty quick here. And uh, it's just time for another episode of uh, Hashtag uh, Ask Beers TV. Well, we're going to kind of talk about all the things from uh, this week's video. On Friday, we talked about, uh, uh, I'm going to try not to use the word nutrients, uh, nutrition with uh, phosphate and uh, nitrate. Also, uh, next week, we're talking about flow. In fact, I just finished shooting that episode this morning. So poor Dave has uh, about 15 pages of stuff to uh, shoot over. Uh, But... You know, so we're just going to talk about all the stuff here. So just for everybody's uh, reference point, we are going to start doing this every Monday at 3 p.m. So you don't necessarily need to wait for the uh, uh, notification on your phone or uh, email or whatnot. You can just go to uh, our channel over on YouTube, and it should just show up at 3 p.m. when uh, when we go. So you can start counting on it. And uh, with uh, Randy, he's going to be doing it on Facebook, too. So same kind of thing. You know, you can like uh, Facebook uh, and uh, follow it, our, our normal Facebook channel. Uh, and then on Thursday at 3 p.m., he's just going to ask or answer all kinds of different questions uh, on reefing, no real specific things. But he may even uh, pick a couple out to, you know, feature for you. So that will be exciting. <coughs> uh, you know, today, uh, last week, we really talked a lot about phosphate and nitrate, and that one came together for me pretty good. Like, I, I think we really covered it in a more unique manner, uh, especially because, you know, what is it that we all know about uh, nitrate and phosphate? For sure? Uh, nothing, man. I, like, uh, very little. Uh, the, most of it is anecdotal information. You know, we do this, we do that, it produces why. There's some stuff that we're really kind of honing in on, but there isn't, like, a whole lot you know for sure. So I got a couple of questions here that I'll go ahead and if I run out of space or whatnot, but I'd rather ask, answer the questions that you guys have here. So I'll just start here. Uh, Rick B., when uh, dosing amino acids or trace elements, should the skimmer or main pump be shut off? Well, yeah, I mean, absolutely, it'd be nice, you know, especially if you have like a, you know, feed mode or whatnot on your like aquarium controller. Uh, the you know, protein skimmer is absolutely going to take some of those uh, uh, amino acids and whatnot out of the tank. Uh, but how much? I don't know. I mean, if you don't, I mean, I, I definitely wouldn't go, like, unplug the skimmer or whatnot. Like, but if I had the ability to walk up, hit a feed mode, and turn everything off for an hour or whatnot, I would absolutely do that. So, uh, so hey, Mark there, what are the steps to set up a tank WWC style with low phosphates? So one of the things I think we keep hitting on there is that they actually do – you know, feed on the hour, every hour, I mean, all kinds of, you know, uh, food, frozen food, right? I guess it's not really frozen, but they have all kinds of food right into the tank uh, every hour. And the phosphates do get high. Uh, so they want to keep them at point one to keep the coloration of the corals up as well as keep the growth up. And what they do is they use that phosphate E. And for those of you who don't know, phosphate E is a uh, lanthium chloride, and it just precipitates the phosphate out, you know. Uh, and, you know, I don't know, there's some debate about whether or not it is removed via the protein skimmer or via a felt pad or just, like, settles out somewhere. But unless your pH is going to go down to, like, you know, 6 or something, it won't, you know, re-dissolve back into the water and maybe it doesn't really even matter where it goes. Uh, the one thing that's kind of cool about the lanthium chloride and how they do it there is, you know, the thought process anyway, is just that, you know, it's a known amount of lanthium chloride in there. So if I have like a 0.2 in my tank and I dose some in there, I figure out that it drops it to 0.1, that dose should actually do a 0.1 every time or, you know, at least in that ballpark. And that's not something you can really do with GFO or whatnot. So. Uh, you know that's kind of cool but I think that's really the one of the only ways that you can really maintain that low you know of night or phosphate with that kind of level of food because there's always like going to be an imbalance uh, between you know what's uptaking the amount of phosphate and nitrate and the amount of food that you put in may not be balanced to what you know the corals and whatever is taken up in the tank so it really kind of depends and you know phosphate is used as a preservative in a lot of foods and whatnot so you know really it kind of depends on the source of food that you're putting in there uh, where did the core line go from the back of the 160? Oh, there's a big chunk, right? Where are you missing it? 
<laughs> oh, right there. So it grows off in sheets, and it actually just kind of peels away sometimes and falls off. So this tank grows coralline like nobody's business. So it, you know, doesn't actually stick to the glass on the back, but it kind of grows in a sheet over it, and once in a while it just kind of falls off. So hey, that's an interesting pickup. Uh, but I actually use it, the sheets there, and one of the ways that we grow or seed coralline in other tanks here is to, you know, crush it up and then, you know, put it into other tanks. I find by crushing it up and patterning it, it definitely spreads inside the tank much faster. Uh, and, you know, my preferred method, rather than just, like, putting a rock in there and hoping that it releases spores fast enough, that just takes too long for me. Uh, all right. So let me get another one here. <clears throat> um... Is it cold here? Yes, it just reason we just skipped fall, and all of a sudden all the leaves fell, and it's super cold here in Minnesota. Uh, everything we know about nitrate are lies. You know what, uh, Hank? There, I think that is a interesting pickup, man. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things where things like ebbs and flows. You know, I don't, I don't know if everything we know is about this lies, but like. Uh, I mean, the biggest issues before were, like, preventing algae and all kinds of pest outbreaks. And, you know, so we're trying to get low nutrients, low nutrients, low nutrients, low nutrients. And nutrients is just, like, used as a blanket word when we're really talking about low nitrate and phosphate, just probably because it's used uh, in the hydroponic industry and water pollution industry. Uh, but, you know, what we're trying to do is... Uh, you know, probably now we've gotten so extreme because, like, things like refugiums and stuff are so good at pulling out nitrate and phosphate. We may have actually gotten too good at it now, and now we need to add some back in. And we don't really know when it actually gets toxic. And, you know, again, we talked a lot about in that video about the difference between, you know, high nitrate in a brand new tank and a high nitrate in a tank that's been up for five years and super robust and stable is just different. Those long-term tanks tend to tolerate it really well. New tanks, algae explosion. So uh, let's see here. Sam beds here. Jason says, Sam beds, you guys say a tank is more stable in the first year-ish. So would it be recommended waiting full SPS, starting the year with sand, then remove it after a year for future stability? So, uh, you know, that's a good question, Jason, because we're learning a lot about all this stuff uh, together. But I would say that would be the worst possible move you could do. Uh, you know, so we're trying to get the tank stable. You know, that means that we're trying to build up, you know, a bacterial load that's capable of handling the tank and a film and whatnot. And, you know, it isn't the sand per se that's going to do that. It's, you know, if we actually take the sand out later, it's going to be a huge destabilizing event. We might as well start all over, all over from that point on. Not 100%, but, like, you know, very much so. So I would, if I'm not going to put sand in the tank, I would not do it from day one. You know, one of the questions we get probably more than anything else here is what is about this uh, four a month cycle that uh, you know WWC recommends and you know we're going to get to that in the future here but like one of the core things is figure out the amount of rock that you're going to use and cycle it with that amount don't add any more later that also applies to the sand like don't add sand that you plan on taking out don't add rock that you plan on taking out any one of those things is a destabilizing event and likely to you know, cause more issues than it's going to help. All right. Uh, so, uh, Mike there, can a refugium be too good at removing nitrate and phosphates? If so, would reducing the light intensity or photo period make the fuge less efficient? It's another awesome question. And, you know, somebody asked that in the 52 FAQ a while ago. And I said, I don't think it can be too efficient. And I was kind of, you know, this years ago and kind of left over from an idea of, like, hey, the ocean's, like, near zero. So, you know, you're probably not going to get lower than that. But I think what we're finding out is, you know, there isn't as much prey in a tank in here as there is in the ocean. So there's different sources of nitrogen and phos uh, phosphate. And so, like... I now believe it, it can be too good. So there is a too low level. Uh, it may help you fight all kinds of algae but or pests, but it will also make the corals not look as good. So in terms of, you know, can you adjust or tune the refugium? Like, absolutely. You know, the, t the skim or the, the refugium is based on rates of photosynthesis, you know, so it's going to consume phosphus, phosphate and nitrate or ammonia as you know, fast as the photosynthesis is going on. So if you add more energy via light, it's absolutely going to consume more phosphorus and uh, nitrogen. 
Okay, so that could be either two, like length of photo period for the refugium, or it could be the intensity of the light as well. And so, you know, back in the day when we did those first refugium tests, you know, I guess I didn't really think the refugium was super effective. I felt like maybe it was going to, you know, reduce a third of the nitrate or phosphate, which in case, you know, hey, man, that's a huge win. I can do a third less uh, water changes, you know. I can skip one every three months or whatever it is, you know, or every third one. Uh, that'd be a big win for me. And then, you know, when we found out was, like, well, it's pulling out everything. And that's really kind of the core of the, like, uh, uh, system over at Triton is it's you're going to manage all of your nitrate and phosphate that way you know in theirs we get asked a lot you know it needs to be 20 percent the size of the tank or something and I just don't think that's you know that's probably like a blanket statement true but you know it's all about efficiency you know so if I can have a you know 10 percent size uh, refugium for my sump and I just light the hell out of it you know longer photo periods more intense it's about the amount of photosynthesis going on in there. And so I can make, you know, a, you know, 10% uh, refugium probably four times as effective as a 40%. The 40% isn't lit well. So, you know, that is a real big thing here. So what else we got here? Should I run a heater in my ATO reservoir? Well, you know, that's an interesting question. I, I don't think that you would need that. It's probably just another risk, especially if we got empty. Uh, the, you know, water being diluted in the tank would be so little that I don't think it would be a destabilizing event for the tank. So what else here? Uh, so here, Rolando, what does nutrient rich mean in the aquarium industry and does this affect phosphate and nitrates? So, I mean, it really depends on who you talk, and that's why I'm trying to stop using the word nutrient. Because to some people, nutrients means nitrogen and phosphorus because that's what those two words mean in, like, a lot, a lot of different fields. But, like, I think I mentioned in the uh, video, like, if I'm feeding my dog, I wouldn't – and he needs nitrogen and phosphorus too, but, like, I wouldn't talk about that as being the only nutrient. He actually captures prey in the wild and eats them, you know, and the same thing with the coral. So – you know, they're pulling out a variety of different things. They capture prey. They have all kinds of different sources. And maybe in an environment where there's, you know, none of this prey, they're able to absorb it, you know, through their tissue, you know, at higher levels. If the levels are higher, we don't really know. But uh, most people call nutrients nitrogen or nitrate and phosphate. Really, I'd like to get to coral nutrition, which really is talking about amino acids and protein. You know, to some degree, maybe carbohydrates, but I think that the corals through photosynthesis probably produce more than enough sugar uh, on their own. Uh, it's possible, like, hey, uh, if I had a really low light uh, tank, I just couldn't afford to spend a fortune on light. You know, a lot of people will feed various foods to the corals to supplement the energy that way instead of getting it all from light. And obviously, there's non photosynthetic corals that do that as well. So. Uh, hey, are there uh, BK bulls here? Are there any macroalgaes besides Cato acceptable for refugiums? You know what? There's all kinds of them. Uh, I just like the Cato because it's so easy. It just grows in a little ball, and you just take it and throw it in the trash. It tends to stay alive even. You know, if you look at it in the 160 here, you know, it's a foot and a half deep, and it's green from top to bottom, even though the bottom never sees light. It's just super easy to care for. Uh, you know, you can do Calerpa and whatnot. Uh, Calerpa is a little harder to find, A, because not as many people use it. I think it's also an like, invasive weed that like, uh, is regulated, so it's not the kind of thing you can buy on eBay or not, whatnot. Uh, it also goes sexual and like, you know, explodes little pods or whatnot into your tank. And you know, there's a variety of ways that they say you could prevent that, but I mean, I, I don't know why anybody would intentionally put you know, a time bomb of sorts in the tank. If there's an alternative, especially if the alternative's working, you know, the Cato just works so easy. Uh, I mean, if I wanted to build, like, uh, something that just looks nice, you know, there's all kinds of red algaes out there. You know, a lot of people use uh, mangroves. Or, and those are really cool. You grow little trees. Nobody, I mean, there's some debate as to how much nitrogen and phosphorus those are uptaking. But you know what? you know done well those things can actually be their own little display of themselves so you know you can absolutely use other ones uh, i would say 
I were to guess, I'd say 95% of people are using Ketomorpha just because it is so easy to take care of. Uh, and, you know, really there's no issues using it I, that I can think of. All right. <clears throat> uh, what are my thoughts on the Red Sea no-pox? Um, you know, there's a lot of people here that have used it. I've seen a lot of people that are able to maintain low nitrates and phosphates with it. Uh, you know, they say you need a skimmer for it to work. I got to tell you that uh, I've seen instances without a skimmer where it works. So I think that, you know, the whole carbon dosing thing probably isn't as well understood as uh, we all might think. Um, you know, I've personally experimented with like bio pellets where there was no skimmer in any of the tanks and we just dump food into a bare tank with a little uh, a bit of uh, media in it. We could never get nitrate and phosphate in these tanks and there's no skimmer in it. I even let it all die to just hopefully maybe there's bacteria that uptook it that would die. I could just never find any nitrogen and phosphorus in there. So maybe that is a skimmer maybe is not. The one part that really concerns me about carbon dosing is in general, I mean, this isn't a blanket statement because there's a lot of people that are successful using this stuff for a long period of time. But in general, like over a matter of years, you know, people tend to run into an issue of one kind or another. And like, you know, one of the things we said in this week's video was, I know for sure what happens if I don't dose enough. I just don't remove all the nitrogen and phosphorus from the tank. If I dose too much, though, like, you know, say I needed to dose 10 milliliters a day or whatever it was, and I was dosing 60, well, what's the net result of uh, this like, extreme amount of organics, uh, carbon that's going into the tank? Like, nobody really knows, you know, and there's one of the comments this week that he said he does know. Actually, uh, he says here, what happens when you overdose carbon? Uh, I was doing that for a while with my old tank. If you don't have a strong skimmer, there'll be bacterial buildups, films on surfaces. If the skimmer isn't strong enough, we'll remove all that bacteria, but corals will suffer from too little food. They just start bleaching. I literally bleached several cores by inc corals by increasing no-pox dosages suddenly. Now I gave up on this method. Refugium with algae is just better and safer. And so I think that kind of gets to the whole thing with, uh, you know, the, you know, it's simple and stable with the uh, BRS WWC system we're trying to build here is, you know, it's all these options work, you know, but let's pick the ones that are the simplest and stablest, the easiest to recreate and the hardest to screw up. And ones that, like, are based on, you know, no knowledge, stuff that's just super easy to understand. Like, growing a plant takes up nitrogen and phosphorus. This is well understood. Everything about it you, you know already. So, uh, really, it, it's one of the easiest ways to possibly do this. The things that are going on with uh, carbon dosing, all theory, you know, almost all theory. Just uh, we're guessing at, you know, the mechanism at which it's consuming the phosphorus and uh, nitrogen from the tank. Some of it probably accurate, and there's probably some unknowns as well. So, you know, I, it's not that I, I wouldn't use it. I'd especially use it in a fish-only tank. Uh, you know, I guess it just doesn't fit my style of reefing, even though there's, you know, tens of thousands of people who use it successfully. I think more people are successful using something like Nopox than some of the DIY stuff just because there's like a label on it and it says use five milliliters per gallon or, you know, whatever it says on there. Whereas, you know, and then they've mixed up some ratio of vodka uh, to uh, vinegar for a purpose that, you know, they may know, I don't. You know, in the, you know, DIY world, it's, you know, throw a certain amount of sugar, you know, I've heard rice even, you know, use, uh, you know, vodka or the vinegar on its own. And there really isn't a tremendous amount of guidance on to how much you use, just kind of anecdotal experiences from one person to the next. And it's really hard to like hone in on a real thing. So you know, if you're willing to do all that work and kind of roll the dice, uh, you know, you could do that. So I just say I've seen the most people successful using, you know, I hate to say the commercialized thing because it means you have to buy it, you know, and it's not like the cheapest possible way to do it because it's cool. You can use some vinegar, but a, a real guidance, man, is valuable. <clears throat> uh -huh. 
So uh, the red field ratio uh, from Seahorse Whisperer there. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hesitant to even talk about this one because uh, half the people will say, yeah, 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 I mean, that's absolutely. You know, every time that you get the nitrate and phosphate out of whack, man, that's why you get dianos, and this way you get cyano. And I think you're going to start to see that stuff from uh, Triton. You're going to start to tell you what happens when one of these things is elevated and one isn't. And uh, to some degree in the ocean, you see some of this stuff like scale and a ratio up with those issues. You know, different organisms start to win different battles uh, when one thing is depleted and one is, uh, you know, really extremely available. I just don't think you're going to find that in an aquarium to a reputable degree just because some of it is, you know, just, you know, in the air about like which one of these things is going to win the battle in your tank. And I just don't think that. We're not looking at organic carbon in the red field ratio. So for those of you who don't know, I'm going to butcher this, so don't ask me to get this perfectly right. But, you know, when they measure organic content of the ocean, it's really, really stable of, you know, like I think 106 uh, organic carbon to 16 uh, nitrogen to uh, one phosphorus. And, you know... That's, you know, phytoplankton. It's the fish that eat the phytoplankton. It's like there's a ratio of this stuff all over the ocean. So it kind of makes sense to kind of, you know, match that, I guess. You know, not per se like the ratio, but if you could get those right amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and organic carbon, uh, it's probably not doing the wrong thing. Uh, if you're trying to get those exact things in an aquarium, I think you're just number chasing and you're more likely to cause problems than you are to see successes especially because uh, nobody's measuring organic carbon, like the largest number one of the whole equation, uh, or at least they're not doing it yet. I hear Triton's going to allow you to do that pretty soon, and it's pretty difficult to do right properly. So I think we'll probably start to learn stuff out of that. Will we find that there's a like specific ratio, the you know red field ratio of the aquarium? Uh, probably not, and it probably doesn't scale. Like, you know, 16 to 1 when you're down near zero doesn't scale to 16 to 1 when, uh, you know, uh, phosphate or nitrates at 16. I still don't want one part per million nitrate, and I don't even think that that balances, especially with, you know, whatever the organic carbon would be. So the ratio per se is probably not super valuable, but at the same time, like, you can use it as guidance as to, well, you know, 16 to 1, all right, well, maybe I shouldn't be 16,000 to 1. You know, I shouldn't have 30 nitrate and uh, 0 0.03 phosphorus. And that extreme deviation from the ratio may very well produce some pretty undesirable results in your tank, uh, either coral health or promoting, like, certain organisms that thrive in that kind of environment. So, uh I don't think that anybody's going to really bring the red field ratio into the aquarium for sure. There are definitely people that are strong advocates of it. But I'd say there's probably going to be more likely than a ratio, we're going to hone in on the right levels for an aquarium or at least a range that is more specific and it, you know, maybe not a ratio. All right. So, uh, RG, what's the max nitrate to be comfortable seeing in a mixed reef tank that's been going on for years? Well, I mean, first off, if the tank looks fine and you're not having weird unexplained mortalities, uh, you know, I'd probably leave it alone. Uh, but in general, I would say probably under 25 is what I'd be shooting for. And I just say that because after 25, it's really more signs that you're just not taking care of your tank than it is, you know, a sign of, like, what you're doing is good. So, you know, after 25, it just starts to... You know, go poorly, and then you know people say like, "Oh, my LPS like thrives in a dirty tank." Like, dirty is just synonymous for uncared for. You know, dirty is a bad word, man. Like, I, 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 you know, refuse to use that word. You know, I will say it may, you know, uh, thrive in a high nitrate and phosphate environment. You know, or at a specific range, but within that, like, I don't want to like discount random corals that die. You know, because, you know, I've heard people say, like, well, everybody, like, loses corals now and then. And, I, I mean, to some degree that's true, but I don't want to just, like, write it off. So if you're at 50 nitrate or 100 or, you know, whatever, and, you know, it's largely going okay, and you got enough predators for the algae to keep them at bay, you know, your tang gang or whatnot, 
and then you lose a coral every three months, uh, I wouldn't write off the fact that your water's pretty polluted, you know, and like just because everything seems to be like tolerating it. And the reality is, is you probably can't spot the difference between like a level three health and a level seven health of, uh, you know, a euphilia or whatnot. It, you know, at least a five and an eight, you know, it'd be really difficult for the average person to really evaluate. You'd have to have a lot of experience with knowing what an unhealthy coral looks like because most people's version of unhealthy is like right before its deathbed. You know, it's losing tissue, it's all shrunk up, it, looks literally like it's on its deathbed that's when people notice something sick so uh you know i don't think that that's the greatest measurement so just a long answer to i probably wouldn't go past 25 in a really well established tank and you know and in all honesty why i mean i can just manage you know my maintenance to that like if it's ever increasing i'm gonna have an ever increasing problem i need to figure out a balance of stability in the tank at some point i might as well just find it at 25 if it's going above 25, just stop putting so much darn food in the tank, you know, and I might as well just figure it out there. I don't have to figure it out at 150. Um, so even though, you know, it's possible that it'd be okay there, nobody really knows the toxicity of nitrate, you know, to of the various organisms. Like some of them may tolerate it really well, some may not. And, you know, like, I guess it depends on how much money you have in your tank or even more so how much you care for the things that are in the tank. All right, let's see here. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm going to answer this a little bit. I'm not ready to talk about the whole thing yet, but uh, hey, Ryan, uh, not related to today's topic, WWC cycles their tank for three to four months, no water changes during this time, ammonia. So I don't think anybody's monitoring ammonia in that tank. At four months, I mean, ammonia is the least of our concerns. You know, really the crux of this thing is we're trying to get it ready to sustain life in there and like the ability to process, process ammonia is like the minimum you know the minimum threshold of uh, cycling a tank really what we're trying to do is make sure that it can you know take care of uh, all the corals and whatnot in there and stably you know it's not going to be all over the place and there's, you know, a billion different things that are happening in a new tank that we don't even know about. And so just skipping past that, giving it some time to cycle out. And so, you know, for the rough, shooting roughly here, you know, for the first three months, you're probably just going to put the rock in the tank and let it be. Especially if you got dry rock, you know, maybe you had a little bit of food here and there or whatnot. And maybe around the month three, you add some fish. And this whole time, no lights. You know, we're not trying to grow algae in this thing. And, you know, maybe around month, month three or four, none of this is like a exact science. You know, we're going to turn it on. We're going to seed some coralline algae. And, and one of the things that Josh shared with me is he believes that the tank is ready for corals once you see significant coralline growth in the tank. You know, if the tank can't sustain uh, coralline algae or calcareous algae, it isn't ready for corals. Like, it needs to be capable of growing uh, an organism like that before it's ready for corals. And that may not be 100% true, but if I was telling people to look for signs that this tank is ready for corals, that's an absolutely rock-solid good one. Uh, if you're growing coralline algae in there, it is a good sign that you can put some test corals in there and make sure that you're on that path. All right. Okay, uh, how long should you let the refugium rest from light? You know, a lot of people just do 12-12, you know, so they got their lights on to some degree in the, uh, the tank for 12 hours and then in the sump for 12 hours. Uh, some people try to run the stuff 24-7. I've never had good luck with that. It just melts after a period of time. It just stresses all of the uh, chlorophyll or, the, you know, it just stresses the plant out and eventually can't handle it. So uh, somebody might argue the difference there, but like for me, having a rest period is definitely valuable. Uh, and again, I guess I'd tune it to what I want to remove from the tank. So, you know, the second piece of this is, uh, you know, the fact that it increases the pH of the water, uh, you know, but like, you know, first off, it's really there for the nutrients. And like, I don't want to strip all every last nutrient just to get the pH right. In fact, like there's some really good ways, different ways to manage pH than this one. Uh, and 
like don't have the same kind of impact. I would never want to strip out all of the nitrogen and phosphorus to the tank just to have my pH high in almost every way. You know, pH, chasing pH is very often a bad idea. Like as long as you're in a range where everything is living, leave it alone. Um, you know, there's things you can do. Almost all of the pH in a tank is related to maintaining alkalinity properly. You know, check, John, we should all do that anyway. After that, it's the amount of carbon dioxide in the room. You know, so you can, you know, get some new air into the room. You can also use that carbon dioxide media on your skimmer. You know, I've heard people even recyclate, recirculating the air through that media and make it last longer recently. Uh, I haven't done it yet, but I think that sounds cool. So, you know, I, did, I just, I would tune the, the refugium to the amount of nutrients that you have. Uh, do I plan to add ABS board to the 160 after the sand is removed? Well, uh, Tyler, I mean, that's an interesting question. Well, first off, no, I would never remove all of the uh, rock, you know, to get to the bottom of the tank. That would be a huge destabilizing and big pain in the butt, too. too. But luckily, uh, you know, Reef Savvy, who made this tank, actually uh, has that built in to the phantom bottom already. And, you know, really where we got that idea from. Anyway, I just liked it in here so much. You know, it grows coralline algae the moment it's exposed. It, you know, uh, has a texture that coralline algae likes to grow on. It has a texture that corals like to grab onto. It looks better to me than just glass on the bottom. Uh, so, you know, if I was going to start any new tank that didn't already have that kind of thing on the bottom, I mean, I'm pretty sure a whole 4 by 8 sheet of it was like 35 bucks. You know, so it's really cheap. It's this eighth inch textured ABS, and you know, you just score it and cut out a piece that would fit in your tank. We used a little bit of silicone on the bottom to get it down there, and the silicone, you know, should be applied dry and allowed to, uh, you know, cure before use. <clears throat> okay, I moved my tank and my nitrates are high. I did water change yesterday, but they're still high. When should I do the water changes uh, again? So, you know, this is one of those things, like, you just got to keep in mind, like, you know, legitimately what you're doing. You know, it might sound like I did a really awesome 30% water change yesterday, but if I had 100 nitrates in my tank, I did 30% water change, well, 70 of them are still in there. And that, you know, it applies all the way down. If I had uh, 10, it's 7 still there, you know. So it's going to take a series of water changes to get it down, you know. In general, you know, the slower is better, uh, but, you know, the more prolonged it is, the more of them you got to do, you know. So I would say, for me, I would probably do, you know, a decent-sized water change every three to four days until I got it to the goal that I wanted to be, and I'd, you know, watch how the tank's reacting to it. And that's one of the things also, like, that... I try to get across really hard is, you know, I got 100 nitrates and uh, I got phosphate of, you know, point you know, nine or whatever it is. It's super high. And, you know, like I want to use GFO to get it down. I want to use uh, bio pellets to get it down. I want a carbon dose to get it down. I want to use all these things to get it down. And those are terrible ideas. Uh, you know, really the what you're going to do is like strip all this thing around out and like there's a you know whole ecosystem that's reliant on that at the moment in the balance that it's in right now and like especially if i'm going to start dosing you know carbon dosing to this tank you know i'm going to explode some organism out based on this thing and it's going to be down to zero or or not zero but like low levels where i intend to maintain it from that point on like i'm just causing crazy unstable things that go on in this tank way 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 like a million times better use a series of large water changes to get it down stably and you know everything is going to go down together in unison instead of just stripping out one of them uh and you know no knowing, no knowing what organism that you're exploding in the tank so use water changes to get down and then use that new method to maintain that level rather than try to you know fix an existing problem and the beauty about a water change is it always works 100% of the time. 100% of the time, if I want to reduce something by 30%, I do a 30% water change. It will never fail me, you know, barring that I screwed up mixing up the salts or something. Like, uh, as short of that, it will always work. 
You don't have to be a rocket science to figure it out. I'm not imagining like how much carbon dosing and what the effects and all this stuff is going to happen. So, you know, really that's probably the best way. Uh, Ryan, with room for only one, large skimmer or large fuge? Wow, that's a compelling question for me. Uh, man, I don't know. The... I would say that the large fuge is going to be by far the most effective. You know, a large skimmer is going to, you know, presumably, or let's say you have it set up an uh, average, uh, you know, efficiency, it's going to probably reduce it by, you know, 30, 40 percent the amount of dissolved uh, organics in the tank. The refugium could be zero or 100 percent effective. It could remove it all. You know, uh, and it's just uh, doesn't require maintenance. I don't have to tune it. I don't have to, you know, empty a cup that smells like poop. Uh, I don't have, uh, you know, my wife yelling at me for put poop in the sink. Uh, I don't have all kinds of stuff, you know, and it's just a lot easier. I don't have electricity. I don't have a pump to maintain. I have a light that shines down at some algae. It's super duper efficient. Now, the only thing I'll say outside of that, though, in, in favor of the skimmer is, you know, for the most part, I see a lot of tanks that just seem to have less like uh, L or bacterial blooms that have a skimmer. I see you know a lot of tanks that just look you know clearer uh, with a skimmer. There's obvious like gas exchange things that are happening in there. So you know if you have, I mean, there's just a wealth of air water interface that's going through that skimmer. So you know it's really giving a lot of gas exchange. So if you have like you know, four fish, like this tank has almost no fish, so, you know, it wouldn't be a real concern to me, the gas exchange. But if you have, you know, a wealth of fish in there, I would have it for that reason alone. But if I could only have one and the primary concern was nutrients alone, one of them works all the way and the other one works partially, so I guess I'd have to say refugium. Uh, all right. So, Ryan, when you're going to write some books, never, man, uh, ever, ever. It takes years to write books, and by the time that they're released, they're out of date. So, I mean, like, even here, you know, it's a couple of years ago, we did the BRS-160, and I'm sitting here today, you know, contradicting some of the things we shared back then. You know, back then, nitro getting near nitro zero nitrogen and phosphorus was, like, almost the goal, especially with the Zeovit system. Uh, you know, and the Zeovit system adds a lot of foods back in to compensate for that, but, like, or, nutri or nutrition, I should say. And, but, like, man, uh, what we're learning in... in it's just too fast for a book. I mean, you haven't seen a book for the reefing industry in so long. And I'll be honest, man, trying to write some of this stuff out would be monstrously hard. If I try to show write a book on how to, you know, maintain your carbon reactor, it's going to be 40 pages in something like side of a video I could show you in two minutes. Yeah, so, you know, I just don't think we're going to see a whole lot of books. And even a lot of the blogs are kind of going away, man, just because reading, you know, pages and pages and pages of stuff. There's just different formats to, you know, deliver a lot of information. All right. Do you know when uh, of a way to start a healthy pod population in my live, ro live rock Well, curing the live rock? Well, I, I'll say two things. Uh, uh, throw some food in there. You know, I would say even just throwing like a shrimp in there, a whole one, like a, when you'd eat, and just letting it rot, the pods will go all over it and they'll multiply fast as long as there is a source of them. And as far as providing a source from them, I've heard of people like autoclaving a tank and, you know, sterilizing anything, and still pods, you know, appear in the tank miraculously i don't know where they come from uh, they're obviously not coming out of thin air but like it'd be hard to prevent pods from you know entering your tank in fact i saw a presentation at uh, a magna once where you know somebody who sells pods for a living uh, you know somebody stood up in the crowd and said don't you feel kind of like a sham because you couldn't prevent these things from populating your tank and they're like well you know people want to buy them so we sell them like whoa <laughs> you know, it's true, man. Like, they're just going to grow. Like, I don't think you could prevent it. Maybe once I put a source of these things in there, you can definitely, you know, speed it up with a higher source of them. You know, algae uh, barn sells a variety of pods, and you can get a, you know, a healthy jump start on it or whatnot. But, like, 
people actually sell these things to, like, try to feed your mandarin or whatever, which, like, I don't know how many are in that bottle, but, like, not even a day's worth, you know. So, like, that is not a solution for that by any stretch of the imagination unless you're, you know, filthy rich and you just want to dump in pots, like, all day long. In which case, I don't even understand because you could just have a refugium and do it for free, you know, or really anywhere. You know, even in today's rock, like, the rock structures that people build now with, like, a reef saver that has all those holes in it. There's so much area in that rock and so much detritus that settles out. Like, I mean, you just really can't prevent a decent pod population from, you know, tanking over the tank. And if you can't, it's probably something else you're doing wrong. You know, like you should really start to look at, you know, what is it that's going on in this tank? You know, outside of you got a predator or whatnot that is eating them. All right. Okay, so uh, what can I do to get nitrates into my tank? You know, so I guess there's two, you know, approaches to that. One, I could just dose nitrate to the tank. And, you know, there's two of them out there that people use. the sodium, I think it's potassium nitrate, or and then there's just sodium nitrate. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know why you'd use the potassium one. Uh, I don't dose things that have other things in them that I'm not intentionally trying to dose. Probably not going to hurt anything. Probably won't be a lot. I just choose sodium nitrate personally uh, because I know I'm dosing the nitrate, and the sodium is not a big deal in salt water. So uh, it's not the you know potassium. It's just, I, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like it's not going to cause harm probably, but like I don't know. I just I wouldn't dose you know the something that contain magnesium either for no reason. Uh, I mean, not to be really cheap, but this stuff is so sodium nitrate, a little jar of it, I mean, you're dosing, you know, one part per million a day or something, like a little jar of it will last you the rest of your life. So cost really isn't the thing. Just find the right thing and use it. Uh, And, you know, uh, outside of that, you can dose food. So in this tank, we dose the neonitro, I think it's called, from Brightwell for a while. I can tell you for sure the colors in the tank actually went up. I just like, you know, it just felt a little mad scientist for me to be dosing all of the, you know, chemical like that directly to the tank with unknown effects. And I couldn't get it above zero anyway. And we started dosing two parts per million nitrate a day to the tank. And I still couldn't get it above zero. And like, I just didn't feel comfortable with that whole thing. So I just want to put more food in it. And so I just pick a cheap source of food and put it in there, reduce, you know, some of the, you know, reduce the efficiency of your refugium or something. Uh, But, like, I just would prefer personally to focus on food rather than dosing straight nitrate and phosphate to the tank. Uh, But, I mean, it's not the, a lot of people do that. The one thing that, you know, concerns me a, a little bit, and this one's like a little bit of a touchy subject, but you know a lot of people use a spectricide stump remover because it's you know a sodium or it's a potassium nitrate that's in there that helps dissolve the the stump faster, and it's cheap. And I don't know, I don't have six bucks or something at you know Home Depot, and, and it's readily available, I guess. But like when I mix it up, it you know is visually brown. You know, and then we mix up, you know, the various higher grade sodium nitrates and it's, you know, crystal clear like it should be. And then worse yet, like I came across a thread, you know, that said, hey, has, uh, you know, dosin spectricide, you know, killed corals in your tank. And there's probably 50 answers in there, of which 40 of them said I used it and it killed my corals. Like, man, this thing literally says, like, stump killer or something on the front of it. And I get the coolness of using, you know, uh, you know DIY solutions. It's fun. It's cheap. I can tell my friends, like, I found the, you know, I've seen the wizard. And I've found this really cool option. But, like, when there's that many people that say I use this and it's killing my tank, like, there's, I don't know, I think in that specific thread, it's calling out people that had that problem. I think there's a ton, a ton, a ton of people that haven't had that problem. Uh, but like, I, I would never use stump killer in a tank that I got thousands and thousands of dollars invested in when, you know, a little package of this stuff probably cost you know, a real, a decent quality, probably 20 bucks and it'll rest, last me the rest of my life. So that like just seems kind of silly, but you know, 
people are doing it. I, I, I asked a, uh, Zach here a while back to find a like a ACS grades sodium nitrate, and you know, to be honest, I'm not really sure where that's at. But sell it in a little one gallon pouch, you know, that you can mix it up to a high concentration, and you know, for a few bucks, you probably have three years worth. Uh, and so I think that we're here trying to find a solution that is both affordable, cheap, and you just don't have to worry about whether or not you know, the quality of it is an issue. All right. Uh, what's the best nitrate test kit? I think a lot of you guys have probably heard me say this a lot. The NIOS one is the faster of a lot of them. They're much easier to read. I find the Sally Furt one, like, impossible to read. That Shades of Pink is just super, super hard for me to read accurately. Uh, other people probably say differently. And then I would say the Red Sea one is the most accurate from our testing, and it reads down the lowest. So if you're, like, looking sub one part per million, that is definitely the one. If you're going to be in the one to 20 range, uh, the NIOS for sure, or maybe even higher than that. But if you're, if you're going to be in a normal range above one, the NIOS one's the easiest to read for me. Uh, let's see here. Uh, what's the best management system for controlling nitrates and phosphates in a smaller all-in-one system like a Red Sea Nano or Max? Is Nopox the best way to go? So nitrates and phosphates in a smaller all-in-one system. So those all-in-one systems, you know, the cool part about it is they, you know, don't require sump. The sump's kind of incorporated into the back. Uh, I'll say it's my own personal experience that the skimmers for most of those things uh, are, you know, not super awesome. I haven't used the Red Sea one yet on the E170 yet, but like all the ones I bought, you know, for tiny little skimmers and in instances like that have always been garbage that I just chose to do water changes instead. So I personally wouldn't bother with those. Uh, in terms of like I mean you could put a refugium on there but now you have this nice clean tank that has a big old hang on refugium on the back It'd be effective just ugly so I mean, if I'm going to try to maintain nitrate and phosphate in there you know it's an all-in-one tank so water changes is like probably the best way to do it you know I mean like a you know on a 20 gallon tank a 25 percent water change is a single bucket you know it's like super super easy and you could probably even put it on like an outer water change with a 20 gallon bin somewhere and not touch it for a month or more uh and it'd be really easy you know outside of that uh, you know definitely dosing carbon dosing uh, like I, you can hear it in my voice that I, like i just don't get super excited about carbon dosing it definitely works. It just got so much mystery to it, and there's so many people that have awesome results with it, and so many have terrible results, and so many of them like, like, you know, it's just so much anecdotal experience from it. It definitely reduces nitrogen and phosphorus from the tank. It just I, I just look for better ways. But if I was gonna do a, an all-in-one small tank, you know. Specifically, if I didn't have like a fortune in corals invested in this thing, I'd definitely give it a shot. But I'd actually probably spend more time trying to figure out an outer water change system because that is like my favorite of all things. Uh, all right. Uh, what else we got here? I have high nitrate but low phosphates. When I try to make my biology, biology consume it, I become limited by the low phosphate. What can I do? Well, I've absolutely heard of people dosing phosphate, if that's the case. You know, uh, Brightwell sells a product for that. I don't know what it's called, but, uh, you know, you could probably Google, I think it's called like trisodium phosphate or, you know, something like that and you could add it to the tank you could probably try some foods that you just know are higher switch to a food that's higher in phosphate uh, you could do you know if, i mean i might want to look at the food that i'm using why is it producing that kind of result uh, i mean maybe the corals just uptake it that way but you know it may also be the type of food is you know low in that i guess uh, you know you could just look at the input in terms of export I mean, I just really don't like adding phosphate directly to the tank that way, but you can. Um, and what else would I do? 
I mean, I guess I would definitely try doing water changes to get it down into a more manageable rate and then try to figure out the input problem rather than the output problem. All right. Uh, what else we got here? We got about 10 more minutes here. Uh, so uh, he's got a question here. I've got so many amphipods in the tank. Is that good or bad? I think that is awesome. That's JJ007 there. Uh, amphipods are our little critters, man, that are going to eat algae, the beginnings of algae. They eat decaying food and waste. They break down all kinds of things rapidly in the tank. You know, a microfauna population in the tank, especially when it's visually active, is an awesome, awesome thing in a tank. So I certainly wouldn't be worried about that. I would, you know, be happy that whatever I'm doing is actually creating, you know, an environment where those kinds of uh, natural organisms thrive. All right. Thinking that a sand set. I was thinking of a sand set and suspended in clear resin might work as a bare bottom to give the effect of sand. Anyone giving it a go? I'm not really sure what he's getting at there, but I will say that like there's a lots of people say that they have glued sand to the bottom or you know tried to like you know create waves of it, you know, epoxy or whatnot, and create a natural looking bottom. Uh, I will say 100% of all of those solutions end up looking like a purple crusty sand or a purple crusty wave because it will all, if it's not turning over, will grow coralline on it 100%. So, you know, just note that no matter what you do on the bottom, if it isn't turning over, it's just going to turn into a purple sheet at some point, especially if you're doing things right. Uh... You know, so again, and we're just kind of hitting on this stuff over and over again here, but, but how bad is it to keep your tank at zero phosphates and nitrates? Well, I tell you that what I'm learning is tanks are pale. The corals are just pale, you know. I, I haven't seen them, like, die from it. They just, as long as there's some kind of food input. You know, for me, though, you know, one of those things, again, is that in the ocean, these things are near zero. And, you know, the common, you know, discussion goes, well, it's like an infinite amount of, you know, you know near zero in the ocean and so it doesn't matter but like that isn't true you know i mean i guess that's true but like in the tank you know if i have like one part per million you know i don't have an infinite amount but if it's always one part per million i have way 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 higher you know dissolved nitrogen and phosphorus in the tank than the ocean it's not an infinite supply but it's in much higher availability now, the part that that misses is the prey component of it or dissolved organics, maybe, you know, amino acids or something. And, you know, in the ocean, you know, often there's all kinds of prey that comes out at night, just swarms of the stuff that they can capture. So, you know, uh, waste, all kinds of different things. Uh, there's different sources of nitrogen and phosphorus in the ocean than is commonly available in the aquarium. So... For me, you know, we're running zero nitrate and zero phosphate in this tank, you know, almost always. And it doesn't matter how much food we're putting in, it's always there. And so for those of you who don't know, like this thing usually gets fed two cubes of calanus, two cubes of cyclopods, two cubes of mysis, a whole ton of reef chili, a bunch of amino acid products, like, you know, all kinds of different things that go into this tank every day. And... I strongly believe the reason, you know, that all the corals aren't super pale is just because, you know, they're getting their source of nitrogen and phosphorus and overall nutrition, you know, from prey type particles that are in the tank, not just from, you know, nitrogen and phosphate. So if I'm going to run zero nitrate and phosphate, I need to figure out a way to make sure there's other sources of that uh, uh, nutrition to the corals. And so like Zeovid approaches that, and there's like a little bit of a mystery in how all the whole thing works, but you know, once you really get a grasp of it, you know, you're running zero nitrate and phosphate in the tank, except for you're adding amino acids, you're you know, adding you know, uh, nutrient-laden bacteria from the pump in the rocks and stuff that the corals capture. You know, they're definitely talking about you know, heavy in, heavy out, and making sure you, you know, take care of the tank. Actually, one relation that we get this question you know, quite a few uh, places is why heavy in, why heavy out? You know, that seems kind of redundant. Like, why would I just not feed so much and you know 
if you had a tank that didn't have a sump, I think that's a valid argument. Like a high flow and low sump, it just kind of sits there and spins around. Uh, I feed enough. Don't worry about heavy out. But in reality, most of us have a sump. And so if I didn't do heavy in, heavy out, what would happen is it would eventually go down the overflow and just find some place in the sump to rot. You know, so, you know, I want to keep it in the tank as long as I possibly can. And then, you know, when it does go down the overflow, I do want to remove it. I don't want to just let it rot down there and turn into excess nitrogen and phosphate. All right. Is it okay to run bio pellets and a GFO reactor in the same time, or is it not so effective at bringing the nitrates and phosphates down? Yeah, so, you know, for me, and one of the things we did in this video was talk about, you know, GFO, and in general, like, I, I don't like running GFO in anything, you know, the tanks that I run. Uh, you know, I would use it as a tool. When phosphates are too high, I would run some GFO and get it back down. You know, in the past, and especially in my first tanks, I loved GFO. GFO was awesome, man. And my tanks were awesome because I was using this GFO, you know, and they're mostly like LPS tanks and stuff. But, like, you know, what I was running into was it was like a really artificial way to think that, you know, the tank's doing well. Because the phosphates are so low, I'm not having any algae at all in the tank. But, like, the nitrates are, like, untestable. They're so high. And it gave me this really artificial, you know, concept that my tank is clean and looking good. And the problem is, is, like, once the L or the GFO goes, all of a sudden, you know, I have this really, really high nitrate. And so it's any detectable phosphate, boom, algae. And, like, in a really uncontrollable manner, especially, you know, if you have, like, a, something die in there, like a, you know, a tang or whatnot that was keeping it at bay at the same time. You know, so that's, you know real bad so in, in relation to with the bio pellets you know i have like never run a bio pellet tank you know myself and again it's carbon dosing there's so much unknowns to it and there's just so many other easier ways for me to achieve the same goals uh and so if i were going to run them together I mean, i would absolutely think that you know stripping the phosphate down to zero is going to have an inhibiting effect on the amount of bacteria that I can get to populate within and consume, you know, the organic carbon within the bio pellet, you know. And again, I'm just going to say, like, the bio pellets work, you know, lots of people have success with them. Like, that one to me is, like, in theory, it's, like, you know, controlled because they're only going to eat off the solid surface as much as they need, but, like... I don't know if that's true in, you know, every case. Is it grinding bits off and dissolving in areas of the tank? Who knows? You know, so to me it's uh, the most unknown. If I had to do carbon dosing, I'd personally much prefer a accurate dosing pump and dose a known amount of carbon than just rely on this uh, bio pellet reactor that is unstable in the fact that, like, at the moment it, the pump goes out or decides to stop, you know, tumbling, all of a sudden there's a destabilizing event in the tank, you know. Same thing with the, the you know, liquid, you know, uh, carbon dosing. Like, you know, it's hard to say why some people have success and don't have success, but, like, stability is probably one of them. You know, it's probably people that are dumping, you know, 14 milliliters a day in there, and then they, like, take three weeks off because they're just lazy, you know, or, like, they went on a vacation or they ran out, you know. Well, like, now there's going to be a major destabilizing event because there's all kinds of organisms that are built around having that available. And now these excess nutrients that are going to be there, some other organisms in the tank is going to take advantage of that, you know, and we don't really know what it will be. Yeah, so uh, uh, the carbon dosing to me, the most important part of it probably is stability, setting it up, committing to it and saying, all right, I'm going to make sure that this thing is dosed every day on time the same way, preferably throughout the day in very small amounts. All right, a couple more. Okay, in the last video you mentioned using, not using a refugium to start, but more as a tool in a case you need what you need to do. But if you're planning a refugium to be double function, one filtering food stores. Uh, okay, so... I, I mean, yeah, I think that's true. You can just plan to have a refugium from the beginning. There is no problem with that. Uh, you know, in terms of the method that we're doing here, I'm trying to, I think we're trying to get across that you don't need one per se, but, like, if it's almost a preventative measure in a new tank. So if I was going to set the tank up 
I think I'd still approach it the same way. Like, I'm going to build a refugium. It's going to maintain my nitrogen and phosphate levels in my tank. And, you know, but what I found is actually, for me, it's easier to implement it after the tank has kind of stabilized around the nitrogen and phosphorus input and cycled than it is from day one. So also, we don't know that the, you know, Cato isn't taking up ammonia as its primary nitrogen source instead of nitrate. And so just letting the tank cycle first, I think, is just best. Let there be some nitrogen and phosphorus in the tank and then implement the refugium afterward. And so, you know, I kind of said in the ULM series we're going to try, you know, doing it from the beginning to, you know, you know prevent algae from the beginning. You know, that's the nature of, uh, in the ULM thing, it was called tank trials for a reason. And we're going to, like, you know, try some fun stuff and, you know, share with you guys what happens when we do it. And what happened was it was really hard to get the, you know, Cato going. Like, it just, it was, you know, kind of stalled out and, you know, kind of broke up into little bits and just wasn't super healthy. And so I guess I just wouldn't do that again. I would wait for the tank to cycle properly, and then I would add the refugium in afterward. <clears throat> All right. So I got, all right, it's 401. So I'm going to add one more question here. If your nitrates and phosphates are already zero, is it safe to start GFO, is GFO or Zeovit to combat nuisance algae uptaking all the nutrients? So, yeah, you know, I mean, this is a stage of the tank question I, in my mind because, you know, if it's, I'm using GFO in the beginning to fight you know, algae issues that uh, I don't want to encounter with a new tank. So a new tank, uh, new surfaces, it's, you know, bright white, it, you know, hasn't won that, like, battle of, you know, microfauna, algae, bacteria, whatever, you know. So, you know, in the beginning, using something like GFO to prevent the algae from winning the initial battle is super valuable. Uh, you know, after that, I, I don't know. You know, and uh, the zeovit, the zeovit thing is low nitrates, no low nitrogen, low detectable nitrogen and phosphorus in the tank, super high nutrients. So you know, nutrients being the amino acids and carbohydrates and you know all kinds of other elements they're putting in the tank. You know, uh, you know, it promoting bacterial growth that the corals eat again. So, like. I just think the Zeovit thing has, like, been mislabeled horribly in translation. You know, they call it ultra-low nutrient. It's ultra-low nitrate and phosphate, probably really high nutrition or nutrients. Uh, so, you know, ultra-high nutrients, ultra-low nitrate and phosphate. So, uh, let's see. Let's get one more, and then we'll call it a day. Uh, so cycle with your skimmer on, then add Cato later. Uh, well, I guess I'll answer that first question of cycle with your skimmer on. You know, I just like to cycle my tank with everything that is going to be running on the tank. So I guess that probably wouldn't apply to like a UV uh, sterilizer or whatnot. But, you know, short of that, I tend to do that. And, and like if I'm going to add like a Microbacter 7 or, you know, Dr. Tim's to help cycle the tank, I'm probably going to turn the skimmer off for that period of time so it doesn't, you know, remove that kind of thing. I, I paid for it. I don't want to remove it. But I'll, after, after I've, you know, been there and there for a few days, those presumably those bacteria are going to populate a surface or the ones that I want anyway. And I don't have to worry about it anymore. So I'll probably turn the skimmer back on. But almost every piece of equipment other than the, you know, lighting, I'm going to run from the beginning just because I want the tank to stabilize around a normal pattern, not like, you know, think I've cycled the tank and then suddenly, you know, change everything in the end and, you know, destabilize it. And what may seem like simple and mundane, like may not be. Like, you know, uh, I suddenly have the tank stable to ra stabilize around some fish and a food source, and then all of a sudden I turn the skimmer on and strip in half of that out. Well, like, that may be a destabilizing event for the tank. Probably not, but you never know. Like, so just get the tank ready around the things that you're going to do uh, with the tank. 
So uh, just to close this out today, just thanks everybody for joining us. Super fun for me. I get to uh, share a lot of the stuff, man, that I just don't get to share inside of the normal, you know, more scripted videos. Next week uh, we're talking about flow, so it'll be Monday at 3 o'clock again. Randy's doing his Ask Beerus TV on Facebook again at uh, Thursday at 3. And really that Facebook community of uh, hashtag Ask Beerus TV is like 1,600 strong now. There's so many questions coming, I can't believe it. You know, you get to talk to myself. Uh, I answer questions all the time just because uh, I love doing it and my wife hates me for it, but you can't stop me. I really just enjoy uh, talking to reefers and, and helping them. Randy does the same. We're actually hiring somebody else here to help, but, you know, really more importantly, you know, all the community there has learned from all the stuff that we learn from and they share the same kind of information, so it's super valuable. So go over to uh, the uh, Facebook and hashtag at Beers TV, and that way you can like you know take a fish picture of your fish in real time and say man hey you know what's wrong with this thing and i'll tag josh or uh, chad rather in a second and they'll tell you like what you should do to treat your fish you know hey what is this uh you know i see in my sand is it good is it bad hey i'm dosing too much calcium uh, you know i'm consuming uh, you know like calcium and alkalinity are out of balance what's wrong you know really all kinds of questions like should i buy this skimmer or buy that skimmer or should i have two or three or four x uh, turnover in my sump and instead of getting these generic answers, you can get an answer that's really applied to your system specifically if you can take pictures of it. And it's also just a good, cool place to show pictures of what you're doing with the community. So uh, I look forward to doing that uh, all the time, and we do these every week. So uh, I'll see you next uh, Monday at 3 and uh, with our next Ask Beers TV.